Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the government and legal correspondent, and my guest today is Chris Miner, and she's from the Restorative Justice Center. And uh, she's been a previous guest. I think the last time you were on was when our show was called Power News. That's right. And so we want to welcome back back to the show. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. And uh, Chris, uh, I guess we'll start with uh, a little bit of a refresher for some of our viewers as to what the St. Croix Valley Restorative Justice Program is about. And uh, then we'll give them the website periodically so they can go and check out things themselves, but you know, give us an update of what's uh, happening and uh, what's coming up for events. Sure. So starting with, um, I see that you have a website and uh, why don't you give that to the folks? Sure. It's www.scvrjp.org and that's basically our initial St. Croix Valley Restorative Justice Program. So scvrjp.org, not .com, correct? .org, yes. Okay. And so all right, and on that website you have information about people you serve. I want to get into that, but let's start with something basic. Your mission statement at the Restorative Justice Program is what? To build a culture of peace and belonging using restorative justice principles and practices in our community. And what that basically means is that we serve victims, offenders, and engage the community, and we seek to repair the harm caused by crime, um, that, that crime or conflict interrupts people's peace, and it affects your belonging. So if you've been the victim of a crime, you're usually saying, why me or what happened? You feel sort of isolated. And if you've caused some harm and hurt someone, that also affects your belonging because there's also consequences that come with the criminal justice system with that. So we seek to try and repair harm between individuals and try and work things out so people make better choices and decisions in the future. Well, interesting that you work with both offenders and victims then. Yes, that's a unique angle that we have. Okay. so. Uh, again, my uh, own personal background, ha having been a former prosecutor, I remember uh, the last 25 years has ushered in much with regard to victims' rights. Um, the defendants have had rights and the offenders have had rights since the Constitution and those have been interpreted over the years, but it's really a fairly recent phenomenon um, with regard to victims' rights. Um, the domestic abuse statute was also uh, I remember that was after I got out of law school. So um, this notion of both the offender and victim, a little bit unique, but what's your balance uh, when you have your programs as far as how much you serve victims versus offenders, would you say? Well, I would say the, the primary difference is that we reach out to victims with invitation. There's never any sort of charge or fee for them to participate, and we would always try to help a victim, even if there was an offender that wasn't caught in a particular crime. So someone might come and tell a story about, you know, maybe the time their house was burglarized or their car was vandalized, and they haven't necessarily got that particular offender. Now, most of the time with our programs, offenders aren't sort of given the invitation. They're more given the option or the requirement and then there's a fee to participate for them and then we report back to the court and then that compliance sometimes comes with a lesser fee or sometimes even a dismissal of a ticket or it's part of a larger court order and ongoing court supervision. Okay, uh, I've seen that in different cases where it's either a condition of, prob of official probation or formal probation or it can be part of an informal agreement uh, for maybe lesser offenses. Are you dealing with a wide range of offenses then? Yes, restorative justice can work from something that almost seems a little serious um, to, or a little silly to the very serious. So we deal with victim offender dialogue, even in cases of, of homicide or, or motor vehicle crashes. Um, I volunteer for the Department of Corrections and will occasionally go into prisons there and people want to meet the person uh, that might not be leaving prison or serving a life sentence, but that was the last person that, you know, touched their loved one or they ask questions specific about that incident that happened. You know, did they ask for me or, or what did they say? Were they afraid at the moments of their passing? So we teach teachers how to do this in a kindergarten classroom to prevent harmful acts between kids. Um, we build empathy and compassion in people um, and then we help them resolve their harms and it promotes healing for the victim and for the offender. Okay, well you're mentioning a lot of concepts that are on the website if they want to know what your core values are, but I think primarily it's finding meaningful ways to involve the community and then respond to uh, the bases of crime. So trying to get at maybe offense or reoffending of 
Yes, to reduce or eliminate that. And just like the criminal justice system with sort of fines and punishment doesn't want harmful behavior to happen again, neither do we. And what we rely on is a change of behavior by a change of heart. And so when a victim would tell their story or a community member shares how they're impacted, it really gets to the heart of the impact and where the choices the person made, those kind of ripple effects and consequences. Um, sometimes when it's just like in a school that it's just doling out the punishment or it's just the fine or the, the person becomes angry at why they got that and they don't understand the bigger impact for their choices. So we really look at countermeasures on our particular different programs like what can you do to be safer next time so if it's a teen driving circle it's wearing your seat belt if it's a, a victim impact panel that's for drinking and driving then obviously don't drive impaired find a different ride so we really have people seek their own places of making different choices so well you talk about offenders and victims but not all offenses necessarily have an identifiable victim and sometimes they're referred to as victimless crimes are you getting involved in that area as well well our philosophy is there's no such thing as a victimless crime okay <laughs> the idea is um, if someone's you know like one of the things that's commonly think thought of is like is marijuana use. Well, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm just sitting in my basement, you know. Or in my dorm room. Yeah, yeah, wherever it might be. But really what happens is we do know that that's going to um, inhibit your uh, productivity. Um, it's probably going to, you're going to have to do things in secret. You're spending time seeking out or using or recovering from use that you could maybe be doing other things. And so it does impact you in the long run. Well, let's talk about some of those programs and give examples of some of the services you render. I know that you've got um, several, there's about eight different types of sessions that you conduct, everything from uh, teen driving, underage consumption, uh, to victim impact and victim empathy. What's the difference between a victim impact panel and a victim empathy seminar? Okay. The victim impact panel has more of a classroom style. So that's a course for people who need to earn the privilege to drive again after drinking and driving. So we have three speakers up front that share their story. We usually try to have someone who's been a victim, uh, someone who's committed the offense, a previous offender or ex-offender, and then someone from the community, maybe it's a police or an EMS, that tell the story of the impact of responding to impaired driving. Um, it gets pretty emotional, like when a parent will tell their story of their child who decided to drink and drive and then died in that crash, or we have someone who um, decided to drink and drive and had passengers in the car and had a crash that killed a friend. And they've done their jail time and their probation, but they tell their story and they share the incident, the impact that it had on themselves and others, and a reflection of why they tell that. And it's really powerful because people are saying, you know, they did the, the same thing, all the people in the audience, um, the person that's up that's speaking, and yet they say, you know, you probably are angry that you got caught and resentful, but I can tell you I'd rather be in your, she your seat than my shoes up here having killed someone. Okay. And so people fill out evaluation forms for all of our sessions, and they write that it has an impact on them and that they're going to make different decisions in the future. Okay. Now, a victim empathy seminar, how is, what is that? So if, um, if you committed a crime against me and you decided not to participate in restorative justice, we would find a community member that would be in a, in a talking circle, and so a victim empathy seminar might have a different victim or different storyteller or community member, so someone who did a disorderly conduct or had a loud noise ordinance or, um, you know, with college students or, or, well, anybody, you have a little alcohol and it changes the way that you behave. And so sometimes there's vandalism or things that occur around that. So the victim empathy seminar is maybe for the, the bar fight or the disorderly conduct or property crimes. And so we talk collectively how that impacts people um, and what we can do in the future to, to make things right and, and sort of set, set things straight from what happened. Okay. Now, uh when I started that question, I talked about teen driving circles and underage consumption. That seems to be, you know, between impaired driving, which would be the OWI or DUI, as referred to it, depending on which state you're from, um, situation. Teen driving uh, can involve alcohol, uh, absolute sobriety violations, or just simply speeding and unsafe driving because of the doubling of the points and they get in a situation where their license 
Yes. And so it's really interesting what happened is we would have the room full of 40 to 60 people every month with the impaired driving class. And we kind of looked around and thought, well, what can we do next? Sort of move upstream, if you will. Well, if you're underage drinking, you're probably you're not able to go to the bar, so you're probably driving around in a car, or <laughs> maybe you're going to be likely to be that person of drinking and driving. So that's where we developed the underage consumption panels around that. And then we found that the number one cause of death for people 16 to 24 is car crashes. And it's not just impaired. They, they kind of got that message through school, but it's that distracted driving with the texting, with having more friends in the car. And some research has shown that teen drivers will think, well, I'm a good driver, so I don't have to follow the rules. I'm good, so I'll still be safe even if I right. pass a car on the right or I don't obey the speed limit. And so um, we work with young people to get those tickets on that provisional level, and they come in, and, and they're really impacted by it too. Well, and this is, shows the changing area of what you do because technology-wise, I suppose when the Restorative Justice Program started, there wasn't widespread use of texting like there is today. And That's right. We probably still had those bag phones when we started. <laughs> right. But still, with um, the number of people, I'm very impressed that the Restorative Justice Program served a total of 1,820 people in 2011, and then in 2012 that grew to over 3,000 people. Yeah. What do you attribute that to? Um, some, of, some of it is the acceptance of our program, that different that people are, are seeing it happen and see it at work. And so then they're more, um, they're more likely to see that, yes, okay, so anybody who gets underage drinking ticket, we're going to go ahead and send them through this class. And River Falls Municipal Court has been a big supporter of our program. And they, the judge there, Judge Cicero, will actually say, I don't know what you're doing, but we've stopped the frequent flyers coming through. Mm -hmm. And so they asked us to add on, like, the controlled substance intervention. So if someone gets caught with a you know, very small amount at the municipal level, um, then we'd start serving through the controlled substance panel. Um, we also have served different groups like a mock car crash where, where a group of students will hear the message and uh, driver's ed classes. So it's a lot of work. You promote your program, you do what works. And we've also tried to find where the need is in our community. And that's like we kind of grew into the restorative response, which is talking circles after suicide, homicide, sudden loss. So okay. anytime we reach out to people, we sort of count them coming to a session. I want to come to that area because I think that's fascinating. It's also linked to some recent current events on our death-related trauma um, seminars or, or um, committee meetings that you've had. But the, before we leave the controlled substance use, has that been around long enough to determine whether it's had an impact? I mean, it's one thing for somebody to get caught. And again, the mentality of a teenager is they're invincible and um, you know, marijuana doesn't, you know, you can't get addicted to it and so forth, and they have certain myths that they uh, believe. And if they get a ticket, they can just write a check or have mom and dad write a check for $125 or whatever it is and then go out and reoffend or continue to use. Right. Um, have you had statistics long enough to see if doing these seminars in lieu of some type of fine has made an impact? You know, I'm going to have, I should go back and run the numbers, but what I know from running the circles is they're a little bit more challenging. They almost have, like, people have their defenses up, and we use the talking circle process where you identify values and we talk through, but I can tell you the personal change I've seen in the young person that comes up with their hood up and why do I have to be here and that defensiveness that it's natural, it's a plant, it shouldn't be, you know, it's legal in a few states. And we really have to show people that this is your decision to make because now we know that you can go down to a store and buy the incense or the K spice and it's kind of like with our underage drinking class you're not immune just because you turn 21 you're gonna face decisions about alcohol the rest of your life and the same thing with substance use so we've kind of learned to work through with students or young people that are in those classes to talk about what is the impact what are some of the stereotypes where those stereotypes come from and we found that when we help people unpack some of those thoughts and really look at some of the decisions um, they take something from that. And I remember one circle in particular, um, somebody was just sure that he wouldn't have a, be a triple major if he wasn't you know, smoking a little bud or whatever he called it. He was really grounded into this defensiveness. But then we have a storyteller in the circle. And the storyteller shares his journey through substance use and, and life, you know, being in jail or going, you know, waking up next to the bottle and bottoming out with relationships and coming back. And then we have the young people reflect on hearing that story. And at that particular circle, I went to my right to pass the talking piece because this person was, had kind of that attitude. 
It went all the way around, and when he got the talking piece, he stood up, went over to the speaker, and shook his hand, and he said, you got through to me in a way nobody else would have been able to. Okay. So I knew that we... Great story. Yeah, yeah. Well, and circle, that's the word that I was looking for when yeah, I said circle. Uh, meetings. But, um, uh, okay, let's move to the death-related trauma because we had the Schaufhausen uh, mm -hmm. murders, and um, uh, your program actually got involved in that in some degree. Why don't you describe that for our viewers? Sure. So we do the talking circles and that's been an important thing and something we've really learned to do well and we have a lot of trained community members. And in 2010 there were a number of suicides in our community and we started this restorative response. So talking with people after something that's sudden, preventable, and that adds trauma, and, and tragic loss on top of it. So if we've, if we've been sick for a long time with a disease or we're 98 years old, there's a, it's a loss and there's grief, but there's trauma when it's a child, when it's sudden, when it's something that could have been preventable and something certainly as intentional as that. So our program was in sort of a, a unique position to be offering these circles of support with something we've done since 2010. And so we responded to um, support people around you know, the loss of the girls, and especially the teachers at Greenwood Elementary when they started school in the fall. I mean, they all responded so quickly and had things at the school, but then it was time that the helpers needed a little healing. And by the time it got to be the beginning of the school year, we were there and we did a talking circle so people could process their emotions, uh, share with people in a safe space of a circle what the impact had been, and then we talk about where do we find resiliency and where do we find hope. And so that, when it gets shared out loud to people, what you experience is hope. I can be, yeah, my kids give me hope too. And maybe what I thought was hope was a walk in nature. And so we've sort of shared those and this sort of kind of magical collective healing sort of, you know, happens and people feel better and we're able to compartmentalize it a little more mentally. And so a circle helps us all put our perspectives into the center, but then all take our wisdom as well. So did you do this specifically for some community members um, that knew the Schaffhausen family or? Yeah, there, there was a group that was impacted where the family, you know, attended, um, you know, their local congregation, the, okay. the young people, and then the teachers. And then we had another congregation that, that asked us to come and process that. And what you'll find is that, you know, when you put a harm or a topic like that in the center, sometimes people's... Um, that's tragic, but then if they just had a relative die, um, or you just never know what people might have. And I remember one young person, they said, you know, our mom died on Thursday, and this was on Sunday. Wow. Yeah, and so it just, it gave, it gave people, sh it, it's such a safe space and circle that you can really share some heavy things. And the other thing that our program, there's, there's a, so many, I mean, so many more places that, that that responded and came through through that. But what a little unique niche that we had was there's a few people in our community that in the past had had children murdered. And they came to our program or we kind of knew them or they knew to come to us. And, you know, there was another mom who contacted our program and, and um, you know, wanted to reach out. And, and we met and visited with her. So it's a... Well, I'm very impressed with uh, the, some of the outcomes that you said. Not only have you, you know, nearly doubled the number of people that you've served in a short period of time, but you, you said that you do these surveys and uh, of both the offenders and the victims, mm -hmm. all participants in these circles, and like under the death-related trauma we were just speaking about, 100% felt a sense of support mm -hmm. uh, from the, the circle, and under conflict and crime, 99% indicated that the circle was helpful to others. And even on the controlled substance use that we talked about with marijuana and so forth, the 100% motivated to make low-risk choices. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's bound to have an impact, and um, you know that's got to be appreciated somehow. How do you, how does your program get funded? Well, as a nonprofit, we have three major streams. We have our fee for service when people come in and pay, um, foundation and grants, and then we have broad community support where we try to get people to make a donation, write a check, we have a fundraiser. So those three things we balance out, and we operate with like $160,000 a year. So um, we're, we're pretty bare bones and... Um, you must do this with a lot of volunteer help then. Oh, tons, yeah. We have 50 to 70 uh, volunteers on average. Right now we have three interns and we just really train people into this concept. And the reason we get those kind of numbers, I think, are because people are real and genuine and they're willing to open up their heart and treat people with respect. And one of our first taglines is judge none. 
And so even though a person's made a mistake, and that's what we think about crime is a mistake and we can make less mistakes in the future, um, people respond to that. And I do acknowledge that you know, you're taking the survey right after you've had the, the dosage, but um, right. it's, it's great to see those kind of numbers. And I really track that and it's really important to me that you know, like sometimes volunteers, I mean, we go over, we have in-services, we talk to them, we make sure we're doing this philosophy so we can keep that kind of, that kind of service going. Um, in the area that you serve, um, we serve Pierce and St. Croix counties, okay. um, but I have a tendency to, like, if you ask me to come to a circle, I'll probably say yes. And <laughs> okay. Last night we were at 180 degrees in Minneapolis, which is a halfway house, okay. and one of our speakers was willing to go over with me, and so we did a circle with some men that are coming out of prison there. So we also served the Hastings. It must Hastings have been interesting. Area. It was very interesting. Um, as, it, it was very powerful. As we got started, I was kind of... Um, a little bit intimidated with with some of the um, looks of people, I guess, if you would judge a book by its cover. Um, but our storyteller shared her experience in 1974. Her husband was killed by an impaired driver. Her son was four at the time, and he went on to become a pilot. And and um, you know, when he took his pilot license, he came out of the plane and he looked a little upset. And his mom thought he didn't pass the flight. And he mm -hmm. said, "When I was up in the clouds, I just thought I won't hope my dad's proud of me." Wow. Yeah, and it touched the guys, and it touched their hearts. And so these men that I was really kind of intimidated by their looks, somebody opened up about, he was 44 years old, and when he was 12, his brother took his life when he was in Vietnam. And it affected his mom so much that she died of alcoholism three years later. Mm. And the connection for the story he had was that his brother died on Christmas Day, and for our storyteller, her husband died the day after Christmas. So when she shared that Christmas was never the same, he immediately connected to that, felt safe in the circle, and shared that experience. So you never know how you're impacting these people and what kind of connections they might make. But um, you mentioned the 50 to 75 volunteers. Um, are, do some of them have a background as even offenders, not just as somebody touched by crime on the victim side? Yeah, we pretty much, if you fail your background check, you're a good volunteer, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a wide range. So there's the wisdom of the lived experience. So for example, the speaker who decided to drink and drive and killed someone, you know, he found sobriety from that experience and he works very hard to maintain that, but it also is part of his giving back and actually working part of his program by talking, you know, he, some of the people in recovery that volunteer will say, you guys keep me sober, and he's talking about the kids with the underage drinking. Okay. So that's one part, but we also have a balance. You know, we like to have, um, you behave differently when grandma's in the room. So okay. we like to have the retired volunteer with the college students. And, and then what's really cool is that, you know, we had a business owner in River Falls who was just sure that all the college students overdrank and destroyed the front of her business. She even moved it off Main Street. Okay. And, uh, you know, she was complaining to the mayor and I happened to be there. And I'm like, why don't you come volunteer? Come check this out. And so when she could share that story of her business experience, it helped the young people realize, wow, I usually act better in my hometown because that's home and I don't treat this like my home community and I should probably do that. Like they got connections and the kids get brought back into the fold when, uh, you know, they're there in the class for an underage drinking ticket and this retired teacher is saying, boy, you're a great group of kids. That's really, re you know, makes me feel good about the future. So that's the kind of volunteer we take, you know, anybody. Somebody came in to ask to use the phone. I recruited them to volunteer. I was at another meeting and I had somebody follow me back to the office. So if you're interested in giving back to your community and it's a unique way because right. we want you to tell your story. Um, most sessions are in the evening. There's, we do ask for that commitment to come to training and get an understanding of the circle. Uh, some people it fits, some people it doesn't. Um, but we'd, we'd love to have anybody that if you think you're interested, go to the website, check it out. And it's, I think it's a great way to serve back to the community. We enjoy it a lot. So you don't necessarily have to be a storyteller. You can be a participant in other ways. Right, right. And that goes back to like when we talk about the victimless crime, um, we had one of the board members. I try to get my board members in a circle too to experience it. And what had happened was these boys, um, they accidentally lit a car on fire. Uh, but they'd actually went back to town for gasoline and more lighters. And, and we sometimes don't debate the facts. We get to the impact. And he related a story. Uh, his brother he had to give his car to his brother. He worked real hard and his parents said, oh, give it to your little brother. And he always felt like his little brother got the easy way out. Um, he rolled that car like within three weeks and it really upset him. That car, he had a lot of attachment to it. And he talked about that, that, you know, it might just seem like a vehicle, but for some people it can have a lot of meaning. And he felt better. Like he didn't even really know that this resentment towards his brother was back there, but it was a story that he brought out. And so people usually leave and they feel like, gee, that circle was for me, you know, because they, they cool. share a story. Yeah. 
So some people could volunteer their time, and if they don't have the time or inclination to be able to participate in, in that type of uh, more intense way, they could uh, participate by contributing. You mentioned about a third of your stream is from individual contributions, and you have an event coming up. Why don't you tell yes. the viewers about that? Yes, we have our fourth annual Walk for Awareness. Uh, so the Walk for Awareness is to support those people impacted by that tragic loss. So survivors, friends and family members of people from homicide, suicide, traffic fatality, sudden death, um, so we put signs of these people out on the walkway. Uh, their family members give permission. They write a little phrase next to the person's uh, picture. And we go out on the walk and we leave luminaries. And we just remember that lives are lost by things that are preventable, like driving impaired or um, texting or, you know, um, the memory board there is Brad. And, and that was, you know, a bar fight outside of... Uh, is this on your website or yes is this that's a great handout that explains what the memory signs are and and that's a handout under our events page you said brad his full name bradley simon and mm -hmm. and he was obviously uh, uh, killed yes and so but this he that's just an example you can have memory signs for somebody else and uh, there's no cost associated with a memory sign? That's right, and that's part of why we really try the fundraising efforts is because we don't want to charge victims for anything. The cost has already been too high. The cost paid has been too high. And so we remember the loved ones and we allow community that want to support, want to do something for someone that's been in that spot to come out. And as I've gone around and I've talked to Lions Club or Rotary Clubs, I'm so surprised after small conversations later, you know, my cousin in Michigan, he took his life or my wife's brother before we were married, he had taken his life. Like people can see how it affects family members and there's some kind of tragic death almost in every family and it's a way to come, you know, you pay $25, you get a great, you get a nice meal from Bose, you get a t-shirt, you get to go out on the walk, it supports our program, and then you're, you know, you're sitting with someone and they might have a memory sign on the walk and they might not, but, you know, your presence at the walk helps people. So that event is August 3rd. August 3rd, yes. And that is what day of the week? That's a Saturday at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Yep, White Pathway in River Falls, which is right across from City Hall. Okay. So right across from City Hall on Saturday, August 3rd, and uh, you mentioned what you get f for that, and uh, uh, the community gets back um, a lot in return. Um, you said your other stream was grants and so forth. Would that be the example you mentioned, Rotary, and you come yes. to our Rotary Club here at Hudson Daybreak Rotary? Yes. And so you get grants that way as well? Yes. I'm probably writing a few grants a month. Um, I think our biggest one last year was 80000 and you know, down to a thousand and, and we appreciate every dime, a hundred percent of it stays right in the local community and it, it really lets us deliver our mission. And, and we also, part of the accountability, if you have uh, broken the laws, you have to pay for that class. And then we work really hard. If you can't afford to pay for your class, then we have community service lined up. And so we'll let you work those hours off and, and we do different projects within our community too. So people have a way to pay. Okay. Well, if uh, our viewers, um, have either know someone or have been involved as a victim of a crime or um, a grieving family, this would be a type of event that they could support then. That's right. We'd be happy to have them have a memory sign. Um, come, participate, check it out. Maybe next year you'd be ready to do a sign, anything. We're, we really have, um, we're really open door. All right. Well, very good. Well, Chris, we will, well, you had mentioned, I, I was going to try to put a plug too because the Hudson Community Foundation is sponsoring a couple seminars because uh, our community here has been touched by um, controlled substance, specifically heroin, and yes. they're doing one on suicide. And these are both areas that restorative justice is involved in. Are, are you associated with those forms that they're putting on? Yes, we're helping work with some of the parents and I think we'll have some information out that night. Um, we're on the, the prevention end and that's a, pr a pretty, really a good awareness event. That'll be a July 18th. And there's different articles in the Hudson paper that'll be coming out featuring some of the families. And I, meant, I think I saw a start time of 6.30. Is that right? Or seven? I mean, um, it's in the evening on July 18th. Yes. I think um, 7 p.m. might sound And do you know right. where it's going to be? Is it's it? at a church, and I can't quite remember. Okay. But. Well, folks could and should uh, look for that because this segment will be replaying in July, so we want people to attend that. And then there's another one on suicide that will follow a couple weeks later. It's going to be in early August, around the same time as your 
August 3rd event then. Yes, and we'll be sure to add those to our website too. So we'll put that information and post it for people. Very good. And that website again is? www.scvrjp.org. Right, very good. All right. Chris, thanks for coming on the show thanks. again. Yes. And thank you for joining us for another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal.